This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Kevin Johnson, who is the mayor of Sacramento and this year's recipient of the Institute of Governmental Studies Distinguished Alumnus Award. Mayor Johnson, welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you so much. It's great to be back on campus. In what way has religion shaped your thinking about the world? Uh, 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 religion and, and faith and a sense of spirituality. You know, I'm a Christian, and regardless of what religion you are or what denomination, I think there's a lot of commonalities. And I think all of those, you know, lead to, you know, the golden rule and, and those sorts of things where, where we give back. You love thy neighbor and you make a difference where you're from. You appreciate and respect the Judeo-Christian ethics and values. If that's true to you, if it's not within that, that I feel like we have a strong responsibility. And I think a lot of times you realize that things happen because they're bigger than we are. And that's where faith comes in and grounds and grounds a person. You know, for me, one of the, the scriptures, Proverb 31, uh, 8 and 9, you know, speak up for those who do not have a voice. Speak up for those who are poor and destitute. And that's part of my, my ethic is to, to, to be a champion for those who may not have a voice or a seat at the table. And uh, I just want to do my part to make sure that underserved communities and, and people in general have a chance to, uh, to truly participate uh, in whatever endeavor they would like to. And it's important to say where in Sacramento was the, the part of the city that you were from? So I grew up in a uh, underserved part of the community. It's called Oak Park. So if you're familiar with LA, it's like Watts or Crenshaw or South Central LA. You have these parts of a community all over the country, but I grew up in a community called Oak Park, and it was an area that the crime and unemployment and the pregnancy and all the things that you can imagine as negative statistics were very prevalent in that community as I was growing up. And the thing that I was able to do to overcome that challenge is, is get a good education and study hard in and, and sports and being actively uh, involved were the two ways for me to to really stay focused and stay grounded. And, and it seems that, that athletics was a gift that you, you had that you uh, attached to the goal of education, which you had also, I guess, learned from your family background. Yeah, my, you know, my, my mom and my grandparents always told me, you can play sports as, as long as you want, but just after you do your homework. And that student athlete, student first, athlete second. So even in high school, I understood that you have to have your priorities and you have to handle you had to handle your your studies first and once you did that then you can go out and participate and have fun and that kind of structure and thinking and discipline even helped me when I got to Cal because it was very difficult here to balance you know your academic challenges and your your homework and your studies and then at the same time have to go practice for 3 hours and then once the season started you're you're traveling you know playing in the Pac-10 back in my day but now the Pac-12 uh, if you don't have your priorities in order, if you're not very structured and disciplined with what you do, you can quickly fall behind. But the training I had in high school and that mindset helped me here in college as well. And how did uh, Cal uh, shape your thinking? Well, I think what I probably learned at Cal was just the sky was the limit if you take advantage of the experience here at Cal. You know, the friends that I made, the, the faculty and professors that I had, uh, obviously the students that I went to school with, the, the basketball players that were my teammates, the relationships I made in the community, that collective experience and the diversity of Cal helped shape me uh, to be engaged civically, uh, 
to be respectful for people with people who I may not necessarily have a lot in common or necessarily agree with on every issue, but you have to respect people's opinions. So engagement, being respectful, and then this notion of, of, of working hard to better some other place. So whether it be a community or whether you do the Peace Corps when you graduate mm -hmm. from college, but you, you had to have a heart if you went to Cal that was bigger than just your surroundings. It had to be for others somewhere else. And uh, I think that was uh, very influential in my development. So, so I'm hearing that through both in your childhood and at Keller, a real sense of the community. Now, as a, a very successful student ath athlete, it, it would seem that there's a danger of getting filled with yourself. I mean, you're a, a campus celebrity and so on. And so th that's a real difficult set of tasks to, to keep your principles and be successful uh, as an athlete. Let me put it a little bit differently. The academic rigors of Cal were very humbling, so it was not too hard for me to stay grounded when it, when it comes to that. You couldn't get too full of yourself. You can go into a classroom at Cal and have you know, 200, 300 people in a class, and all these kids were 4-0 students, and you know, going on to become doctors and rocket scientists and amazing things, and you have to compete with them and show that you, know, you can hold your own. So for someone like me, it was very challenging. Yes, it was. Um, but you, you, you realize that on the basketball court and being an athlete was part of the college experience. It was a very small part. Once you got off the court, then you had to go to the library and stay till midnight like every other normal student because that's who you were competing against and who, and who you were competing with. And I think that uh, was very humbling but very fulfilling at the same time. Now you went on to a great uh, NBA professional uh, uh, basketball uh, record, uh, and you were obviously a stu superstar. Uh, you were both at Cal and on, in the professional team a, uh, a point guard. And I'm, I'm curious about what you learned about leadership and teamwork on uh, the basketball court. So I, I think the first thing I say that you know my position was a point guard and as a point guard it, it goes back to my ethos you, a point guard gets everybody on the team involved so you have to be unselfish and you have to have a kind of a shared vision you have to say here's where we all want to go and get all your teammates on the same page and, and push or pull or head in that direction so uh, that was important and then setting clear goals that on a team your individual goals are are one thing but your individual goals has to be a part of a collective goal and that collective goal is to, to win a championship or to go to the NC2A tournament if you're in college. Um, so there was a lot of similarities in terms of leadership, but you have to lead by example. So for me, it was always try to work harder than everyone else. I'd be the first one to practice or the first one to a game, and I'd be the last one to leave practice or the last one to leave a game. And I think leading by example and making sure you're unselfish is something that your teammates would respect and they follow a person that they believe that has their best interests um, at heart. Now, while, while you were in professional basketball, you were already uh, still committed and implementing this idea of serving the community, basically, even before you had gone back to Sacramento uh, on the board of many foundations and so on. So, so that, that's really something that never left you. Yeah, I, it's just who I am, the spirit to serve and give back. And, you know, I remember my grandfather, um, you know, when I was a young person, I was five years old, and he would go to sleep early at night, and one night he woke me up at uh, 11 o'clock at night, and he said, get in the car, and we hopped in the car, and we drove to some projects in Sacramento, so really low, even a lower income area than we lived in, and it was right before Christmas, and he gave me uh, $20, and back then, I'm five years old, so you're talking 40 years ago, $20 was like equivalent to a $200 bill. He said, knock on apartment 2C and give the lady the $20. So I gave the lady $20. She started crying. I ran back in the car. I looked at him like he was crazy. He put the car in reverse and he went home and didn't tell me why. Two days later, I'm like, I had a dream that we got up and went to this house and I gave away a $200 bill. I forgot about it. A couple years later, my grandmother was sitting at the kitchen table and I said, hey, Graham, I had this dream a few years ago that Grant woke me up X, Y, and Z. She said, no, it really happened. I said, what was the deal with the story? 
That lady was a single parent, and two days before Christmas, she had five kids, and her house had been robbed, and all the children's presents were stolen and taken from the kids. In the news station, they broadcast the lady's address, and my grandfather got up and said, we're going to go do our part, and we're going to give this stranger $20, because that's what being a good neighbor is all about. And I can't escape that, and that's why, as an elected official, you know, my job as a public servant is to try to solve problems and make a difference in, the pe in people's lives in my community. Uh, not when it's convenient, not when it's just easy to do. You got to do it sometimes when it's not convenient and not comfortable. And I think that, again, comes back to, to my grandfather's influence. In a minute, we'll talk about what you've done in Sacramento. But first, I want to ask you, did, how, how did athletics and basketball and being a point guard prepare you for politics, or did it? Oh, it, it did. Remember, when you play basketball, they throw elbows <laughs> a lot. And I thought basketball was a, was a dirty sport, but politics is even dirtier, and they throw even more elbows. So needless to say, I, I didn't realize my 12 years in the NBA would help me um, for my political you know, career. I think the other thing that I've learned is, you know, as a basketball player, you play, at, you play home games and you play road games. When you play at home, everybody cheers for you. When you play at ro road games, everybody boos you. When you're a, an elected official, you have so many constituents, and you might do something that 52% of the people think it's the greatest thing in the world, and 48% of the people think it's the worst thing in the world. And you have to just balance that. You have to stay true to your course, true to your beliefs, listen to what people are saying, and then ultimately my job is to make a judgment call and to be fair. I had to do that in basketball as well. In basketball, I had you know, 12 teammates. They all wanted the ball. They all wanted to score more. They all wanted to shoot. I've got to do my job of trying to balance all of their interests collectively and then ultimately make a decision that may not make every teammate happy on a regular basis, but if we had this similar goal that we were all aspiring to, to go after, they would understand that and respect in the political world. You have all these different interests and different constituents who all have their interests and they're all the most important thing to them. And it's just challenging at some point in time to, to separate and prioritize and try to make everyone happy. And that's where I go back to. You listen well, you pay attention, and then you make a judgment call that people will say, I respect and it's fair. And if I do that, then I think I've done my job. Now, you decided after uh, leaving basketball to go back to your city. And, and as I understand it, your focus at first was on the schools and changing the schools. Talk, talk a little about why you started there and how it led to other things. So I, I grew up in Sacramento, came to Cal, I got drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers, played for the Phoenix Suns after I got traded for 12 years. I lived in Phoenix from 88 to 2000. And I knew when I retired from Phoenix, I wanted to move back home. Uh, I moved back home uh, in 2000, but in 1989, after my first year in the league, I started an organization called St. Hope. It's a community development company. And its mission was to revitalize Oak Park or inner city communities through public education, economic development, civic leadership, and the arts. So it was a very holistic approach. And I had done that and had been working on it for all my years in the NBA. And when I retired, I knew I wanted to go back home and build on that work. And I did. I moved back in 2001. 2002, we started charter schools. And uh, kind of the rest is history on education. I've been a huge champion for public charter schools around the country, and today I'm lucky enough to chair Secretary Arne Duncan, uh, his education task force in the country for all mayors. And I think our country is experiencing a crisis when it comes to public education. California is a state. We went from first to worst. My city in Sacramento, I, my, everybody in our community would hear me say over and over again, you can't have a great city without great schools. So that's just my passion and my commitment, and it's something that started many years ago. I was able to build on it here at, at Cal, and it's certainly in my days in the NBA and now as a mayor. I, I'm curious, because you're, you're describing a holistic vision, that you can't just fix this unless you fix the whole community. W where does that come from? Is that is that from your background, having lived in the hood, or is that things you learned in your education or a combination of them or what? It's a, it's a good question, and I think I learned it from living in, the, in a neighborhood that was underserved. So when I retired and I moved back to Sacramento, uh, we said, let's focus on, on after-school programs and education. And then you realize if you're doing an after-school program, you only have the kids a couple hours a day. Well, what's happening the whole school day? And if they're not getting a good education the whole school day, 
then the after school time is not going to be enough. So that's what led us to, it evolved into charter schools, which meant we can help and control this kid's environment from 7.30 in the morning to 5 o'clock. So you can build an after school on program to a regular school day if you run a charter school. And then we realized that kids need and families need a place to work or you've got to create economic development, you've got to create jobs and employment opportunities in the community because everything can't come down to a government program and government subsidy. I think they have the role of government has its place, but that led to economic development. Uh, you know, creating these jobs and a, 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 a vital economy in the Oak Park area. So education and economic development went hand in hand. The civic leadership piece meant that when young people went off to college, we want them to come back and serve and give back. We want that commitment to volunteering, which was part of the, the holistic approach. And then lastly, arts and culture. We're about your history and your heritage and appreciating where you come from and just getting our kids to understand that. And that was kind of a four-pronged approach. But the two big ones were, were education and economic development. In a lecture before you came for this interview, you, you uh, were telling the students about how you, when you played in professional basketball, you would turn each trip to a, a city into a field trip. So I, I was, you're left with a strong impression that, that you've always been a learner, no matter where you were. And your, your early background may have put you in a disadvantaged position to, to, uh, to get all you could at a particular moment. But, but you were doing it on the side. You know, I was a kid that was very curious. So I remember at night, you're supposed to go to bed at 9 or 10 o'clock, and I'd get a flashlight, and I'd be reading the baseball digests about all the records that Major League Baseball players, you know, had achieved over the years. So I was always curious and always liked to read and always liked to learn. It's partly why I came to Cal. I came to a great, you know, institution, not because it was a great basketball institution, but because it was a great prestigious academic institution. So I've always been curious to, about learning and trying to better myself and being a constant learner. Then I got to the NBA and I'm thinking, I get to visit 29 cities around the country. Holy moly, for free? These are like field trips. So if I'm taking field trips around the country and somebody else is paying the tab, I better go out and see places and meet people all over this country. So for the 12 years that I played in the NBA, you know, I visited countless cities on multiple occasions and I can tell you everything about Indianapolis, I can tell you about Atlanta, I can tell you about LA, I can tell you about Salt Lake City. Not just a hotel or the gym that you played in, but a little bit about the fabric and the culture of those communities and what made them tick. The irony of all that is I met really cool people as well, and now that I'm the mayor of Sacramento, I'm able to take some of the take from some of the experiences uh, that I had as a player and bring back to Sacramento in terms of best practices or some of the things that I'd like to see in a city based on what other communities were doing. And, and I guess in both basketball and as a, as a political figure, you're actually learning from the experience as you're doing it. So you think, oh, we'll do it this way, and then you discover this doesn't work. And Ab then, yeah. Absolutely. You learn from the experience, and you have to try something. You try it, you might only... It might only work one out of two times, but you're not going to know unless you try it. And I think I learned that in sports and certainly as a mayor. Uh, you know, I, I study mayors around the country and I see what they're doing in terms of best practices. And some I like, I bring back, I beg, borrow, or steal and bring it back to Sacramento. And we implement it if it's great. And I thank them later and maybe give them credit and maybe not give them credit. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I mean, I, I want what's best for my community. And I don't have to be the author or the creator of it. And why ream at the wheel if somebody else is doing it? And you have to, again, always be in that state of being innovative on your own but be, having an exploratory perspective and trying to find where, where good things are happening somewhere else. You, you seem to have seen life from all sides now as, as the 60s song went. And, and what, what I'm curious about is that you've had to build coalitions to do what you want to do. And, and talk a little about that, because you, you may have what appears to be a, a left of center agenda. Let's change these communities. Let's build up on the schools. But on the other hand, I think you, you have a sense of you have to bring on board the business community. You have to bring in all of the... What, what is that process like, negotiating that? I think, again, you know, as an athlete playing an MBA, my coalition was 15 you know, teammates, 12, 15 teammates that you have to bring along. As a mayor, 
I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll use homelessness. Um, we had an issue with our homeless population. Oprah Winfrey came to Sacramento, shined a really bright light on what we are not proud of, but it was called Tent City. And you know, rather than sweep it under the rug and act like it didn't exist, we, we tackled it head on. And we said, we're going to solve this problem. And usually, you have just the homeless advocates. So I also got the business community to be a part of the solution. I got the faith community to say, we want to be a part of the solution. I got the civic organizations to say, we want to be a part of the solution. It's not just a city issue. It's a city county issue. And I got all the interested stakeholders in the room, very broad perspective, and said, how are we going to collectively solve this problem? Number one, permanent housing is the ultimate goal. So we set out to get permanent housing units. Two, we want this notion where you're empowering services. Whatever services you provide, you want to empower people who are homeless. I used to think people are homeless because they were lazy and just chose to be homeless. That is so far from the truth. So we came up with four or five guiding principles. You got Democrats, you got Republicans, you got a broad coalition of people all working together. Here we are four years later, and we are now a city that most people around the country points to as a best practice for how it dealt with its homeless population. That wasn't one group or one individual or one municipality. It was a collective effort by many people, including the faith community, who came in and stepped up in a big way. You have worked both in the private sector and in the, the public sector. And I, I'm curious about uh, what are the costs and benefits of, of working with one or the other, or, or, and what, are, what is it like to bring them together? I prefer the private sector. <laughs> the public sector, he, you know, it's just it's, it's hard to, to make the change happen in the public sector. You know, democracy is messy, and we all know that, and that's the best as well. Um, so what I've tried to do is find a balance. As a private sector person coming into the public sector, how can I bring that perspective, still being true to the dynamic of the public world, but there's things that we can do that are more efficient, we can be more accountable, we can set very clear expectations, we can measure ourselves to whatever results we lay out, and a lot of people aren't used to doing that. And I think, you know, the bureaucracy and, and trying to change things, there's just a status quo and a mindset that often works against that. But when you've seen it done, or when you can point to another way it can happen, you know, people are generally receptive to that, and I think we've been able to do you know, good things to balance uh, both of them. But uh, at this point, I'd still say that I appreciate the private side a little bit better than the public. Uh, you are a, a national figure as a, as a, uh, as a superstar in, in, a, in, in basketball, but you're working at the local level. Now, we understand why you've come back to your own community, but talk a little about that. Is that where we're going to solve uh, a lot of these problems, in the, in the cities and in the counties and not at the national level? Uh, you hit the, the nail on the head. You know, all politics are local. You hear that all the time. We can go out as mayors and talk to President Obama, and we can talk about federal programs or stimulus dollars and 101 things. The way anything's going to be successful in terms of improving the economy or dealing with unemployment or putting people back to work and job creation, it's got to happen at the local level. What we as mayors do up and down the state of California, we're where the rubber meets the road. We can take dollars and we can implement them in real time. We can create an environment where we can be a laboratory and try things that other people can't. We're very direct. Um, you go, some dollars go through the state, they funnel off a portion of it. By the time the dollars get to a city, what started out as a whole dollar might end up being 25 cents. If you give the dollars directly to a city, we're in the position to take that whole dollar and put it to put people to work. And at the end of the day, in this economy, it's top of the mind for everybody. And that's where I think the president understands. He's invited mayors to the White House at least a couple times a year, every year, because he knows that we are the ones that can solve the problems. When you're talking about the number one issue in this country is unemployment and putting people back to work, mayors are the ones who have the ability to do that. In, in, the, in the context of this uh, devastating inequality that, that has, has resulted from uh, 30 plus years of national policies, what, what, what are your thoughts about how cities can help to change that? Is it that they, they need money uh, from uh, the federal government? Or is it building coalitions with business, creating an environment in which there will be incentives to hire? 
It's a combination. Let's just take California and Sacramento. Businesses don't want to come into California because they feel um, the regulatory challenges of California aren't conducive to businesses thriving. There's nothing I can do about that as a mayor because people don't want to come into the state. Secondly, the cost of doing business in California is high. So there's nothing I can do about that as a mayor. But what I can do as a mayor, that businesses that are already in California, if they don't want to leave California, then we can try to attract them to Sacramento. So yes, we need resources from the federal and state, but we need to create an environment and a business climate that's conducive to business and small businesses being able to thrive. And as a mayor, I can do that. We can bring forth incentives, or we can reduce some of our fees, or we can streamline our permitting process. We can create a business climate that makes people say, oh, we can go to Sacramento because the climate is right and it's business friendly. Those are things that we can directly control, um, and we want resources, again, from the federal government I'd like them to go straight to the cities and not pass through the state before they get to us. Um, that would be a preference. Uh, looking to the future, how would you advise students to prepare for the future? I think being innovative uh, is going to be very important. Making yourself indispensable is going to be very important. The days of being average are over. You can't just get a high school diploma and think you're going to compete in this world. You've got to get some sort of post-secondary education. Um, I would tell you know young people, you're not competing just against people in your neighborhood and people at your school. You're competing against kids in India and China. And if kids say, well, what do you mean by that? I'd say, you know, 20 years from now, there's going to be 123 million jobs. Our country is only able to fill 50 million of those jobs. That means 70 million jobs. We're not qualified as a country to fill those. Those jobs are going to go to kids in, again, India and China. I want our kids to know that you are competing against the world. And once our kids understand it, I think we'll rise to the challenge. But that's what I would, that's what I would tell our young people. And one final question. How do we ensure that, that California students have the opportunities that, that you have had? I think we have to make education a priority in California. We are not doing that today, in my opinion. We went from first to worst. Um, we've got to create a much better climate. Funding is a challenge in, in California, and then if you take funding out of the equation, the dollars we do have, we're not spending on what works. You know, I think, one, we should put kids first. I think, number two, talent matters. You need great principals and great teachers in schools. Number three, parents deserve choices. We've got to empower parents, but they deserve choices in terms of the schools they decide to send their kid to. You have to um, basically invest in works, that would be number four. I need our state to invest in programs that are working, replicate that, and we have to measure and reward results. If you don't measure it, you're not going to know if it's successful. And quite frankly, uh, I think we're failing as it relates to uh, the way we're educating kids, especially in, in K through 12, and that's something I'm not proud of. Well, on that note, uh, That's Mayor, a bad note. Can we end on a positive note? Let's do that. Uh, how shall we do that? I got that? married in the last year. Oh, and I'm congrats. Very, yeah. Thank you. And, I'm, and she's an educator, so I'm very excited about that. And so are you going to raise a, 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 a group of uh, future teachers? I think if I don't raise a group of future teachers, <laughs> she's certainly going to help influence a group of future teachers and current teachers. So, so will you be the new power couple? I just we should tell our audience who you My wife is uh, Michelle Reed, the former chancellor of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, public schools, and she started an organization since she's moved on called Students First, and uh, I personally think that she's probably the top education reformer in the country, and uh, she was kind enough to marry me on Labor Day of, of last year, and I'm very proud of that, and uh, that's a much better note to end on. Oh, yes, and, and so uh, let me extend from the university congratulations to you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Johnson, for being here today and, and sharing this really fascinating uh, 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 story of, of your journey from Sacramento back to Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.